Hello everyone. In the second video lecture of this week, um, I am going to discuss the problem of the nature of the image in the earliest um, prehistoric context, the cave paintings and figurines of the Upper Paleolithic period um, in Europe particularly. The production of images, whether they are on the walls of deep dark caves or they are in the form of stone carved um, uh, stone carved figurines or mammoth ivory or clay figurines um, this is an essential component of life among these hunter-gatherer societies um, so I feel that it is appropriate to ask this very vital question um, what exactly is an image um, because this is the time uh, precisely the idea of the image um, the idea of representation um, becomes um, uh, very, very vital. Let me start by mapping out the chronological scope of this uh, lecture and the third lecture. Um, with Upper Paleolithic, I'm referring to um, a, about 30,000 or so years prior to the closing of the glacial period, when most of the, uh, Europe was um, covered with glaciers, um, but still small pockets of hunter-gatherer societies lived around um, river valleys, uh, protected river valleys and terraces at campsites um, uh, that have uh, storage pits and uh, protected um, narrow valley bottoms, um, hunting animals who came to the water um, and gathering wild plants. Um, this is the time period when we have solid evidence for the development of sophisticated uh, tools, stone tools uh, particularly, um, and the making of uh, stone, bone, ivory, and baked clay figurines. Um, and, and the highly specialized production of imagery on the deep galleries of karst caves. We see a radical change with the climate, um, with the closing of the glacial period, um, and the eventual onset of the Holocene from uh, 9600 BCE um, onwards with rising temperatures, mild winters, and humid uh, summers, humid summer nights especially, uh, provoking um, the onset of the Neolithic in Western Asia. Um, the Neolithic is marked by, most importantly, the early steps of domesticating plants and animals, um, particularly wheat and barley, um, as well as sheep and goat, um, and eventually um, cattle. Um, hallmark of the Neolithic is the obsidian trade, um, uh, where this uh, volcanic uh, glass sourced at multiple locations um, uh, were circulated and possibly used for exchange, um, talking about obsidian. Um, mud brick permanent dwellings offered space for wall paintings um, to be painted on um, on the walls and Neolithic houses were really this, this kind of an incredible microcosm of everyday life and image making, uh, as we will see. Um, including wall paintings, both geometric and figurative, but also making stone tools um, and figurines. While we focus on uh, the sites um, in Western and Eastern Europe, uh, particularly on the mountains uh, between France and Spain, in the uh, and France and the Iberian Peninsula, uh, for the Neolithic, we will travel east to Western Asia, uh, particularly Anatolia, Northern Mesopotamia, and the Levantine coast. Um, so, paintings on um, in the walls of a series of caves, um, on the walls of a series of caves on the mountains that separate with, uh, France and Spain, is really the hallmark of um, Paleolithic lifestyles. Research um, on caves, uh, such as the Chauvet Cave in France or the Altamira Cave in Spain, has shown that the painting applied to the walls of dark, deep caves have been the work of specialized individuals, 
um, uh, using a variety of mineral and vegetable uh, pigments. Uh, the cave here is not a natural space where its dwellers hang out and idly draw images of their daily experience on the walls. Um, on the contrary, the cave is functioning um, as a ritual space, a space of art making, a magical gallery of sorts, um, and a repository of images that you could visit over and over again. Um, these hunter-gatherer communities did not necessarily live in caves. They lived in terraces overlooking the rivers, sometimes in front of the caves, um, set up uh, in front of the caves. And um, the Chauvet Cave, for example, in southeastern France, um, is such a fascinating example of such um, ritual space um, and Paleolithic art gallery. Uh, paintings, um, these paintings made uh, between 30,000 and 28,000 BCE. Um, this is, um, we're looking at the plan of a 1300 foot uh, long cave, about 400 meters, um, and it has about 950 images uh, that were preserved in multiple sections of the cave. It's an incredibly um, it's an incredibly rich cave with these Upper Paleolithic uh, paintings. And the paintings on the Chauvet cave walls um, support my first argument, um, the idea that there is an interest in prehistoric art to depict wild and ferocious animals, making the images powerful, potent, and apotropaic. Um, and therefore, the spaces in which these images are carved become themselves uh, potent, divine, and efficacious. Um, this scene of horses, uh, rhinoceroses, um, and aurochs, a kind of a wild ox that is extinct today, uh, panthers, um, as well as cave lions we see um, in, the, in the back, and hyenas. Uh, they're depicted moving across the uneven rock surfaces, uh, sometimes emerging from crevices and nooks of the um, limestone walls, um, animating the space with this, uh, this kind of really very vibrant movement to our left. Um, so radiocarbon dating actually suggests that um, some of the overlapping images um, on this scene, uh, you can see some of the animals are actually overlapping, that they are painted about 5,000 years, up to 5,000 years apart. So when we're looking at a scene like this, we're not actually seeing um, a, uh, a painting that is done by one artist uh, or in one time period or even within the generation of um, a, a community. We're talking about a scene that is formed over thousands of years. Um, animate, making this kind of really animating and saturating the space, uh, sanctifying the space of the cave. Um, the images of humans are much less common uh, in on the cave walls, and when they do appear, they merge and hybridize with animals. Um, this rock protrusion in the Chauvet Caves uh, and Chamber depicts the lower half of a nude woman with a marked pubic triangle um, emerging from the body of a bison. Uh, what does this marked sexuality uh, mean, uh, an animal-human hybridity, what does that signify? Um, I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask. Um, one rock specialist, a rock art specialist uh, from South Africa, David Lewis Williams, who is the founder of the Rock Art, rock art Institute at the University of Witwatersrand, um, studied the more recent cave painting practices of South African sun peoples um, based on ethnographic accounts from the 18th and 19th centuries has suggested an extraordinary wealth of information about the image-making process. According to him, um, that uh, the image-making process includes the acquisition of imagery through dreams or rituals, 
um, manufacture of the paint um, that involves acquisition of minerals from faraway quarries um, and sacrificing animals and using the blood of those um, sacred animals. Um, the making of rock paintings uh, themselves um, and then um, uh, using actually the um, a very creative use of the uh, cave walls, um, crevices, uh, its entire complex topography. And, and finally, their sustained efficacy um, uh, due to their potency activated by their weaving and touching um, and so on. So the images continue to be used um, over time uh, and visited uh, for weaving and touching. So this leads us to the, the conclusion that the created image is not a visual replica of a particular reality, but seen more as a reservoir of power, um, a potent magical thing. And secondly, that the images are produced as part of a ritual process um, and that it helps that ritual process, um, uh, that the well-being of the society and the individuals are actually, um, is um, uh, that this ritual process actually maintains. Image making, therefore, is not necessarily an afterthought, a kind of a recording or representation of something that happened or something that you have seen. It's actually, it's not an afterthought, it's actually something um, to, um, it's a tool, it's an apparatus to make an impact on the, on the world, on life, on everyday life. My second argument um, was, um, if you recall from the previous um, lecture, that um, uh, animal and human hybrids um, and the creation of monsters or uh, fictive anatomies, as David Van Groh, um calls this. An excellent example of this is this lion-human figurine from Hollenstahl, uh, Stadel in Germany, uh, a mammoth ivory figure. Uh, it's about 12 inches tall, about 30 centimeters. It's a kind of a really tallish um, thing, um, dated to about 30,000 years ago. It's one of the earliest um, uh, figurines that we have from the Upper Paleolithic. Um, and it was carved with the use of um, a, uh, a flint stone knife, and you can see the kind of really traces of it on his arm. Um, the figurine has a, um, a lion's head, uh, but borrows the posture of a human being with elaborately carved uh, arms, legs, mouth, and eyes. Um, and as uh, Miracle and Boric argue in their paper, um, these animal-human hybrids are often conceived of dangerous precisely because they break down boundaries and question categories. Um, uh, categories of the human and the animal, um, uh, the, their bodies, um, and, and, and so on. So such animal-human hybridity is not limited to representations, is not limited to art, um, uh, is such in uh, prehistoric communities, but also found in the treatment of bodies, treatment of real human bodies, um, as uh, powerfully shown in this uh, kind of cross-species burial that I'm showing you um, of an elderly woman um, excavated at the site of uh, Hilazon Tachtit in, uh, in Israel, dating um, around um, 10,000 BCE. Um, so we're looking at um, uh, kind of a really early Neolithic um, uh, burial. Um, here it's called a Natufian uh, period. She was buried with 50 tortoise shells and some of her limbs uh, were replaced by body parts of a wild boar, an eagle, uh, a cow, uh, a leopard, uh, and a martens. Um, and this burial speaks to my fourth argument um, on the consciousness of death um, and the, uh, this, uh, this idea of the consciousness of death and the unusual set of burial practices 
in which bodies of selected uh, uh, deceased ancestors were reconstituted, were brought up to the surface, reconstituted with material interventions. Uh, the consciousness of death argument is further supported um, by a solid body of evidence from multiple Neolithic sites um, in Anatolia and the Levant uh, for plastered skulls like this one from Jericho um, in Palestine. Um, uh, this was excavated in Jericho and uh, date to 8000 to 7000 BCE. Um, here we have a skull from a burial uh, which at some point was um, uh, taken out and sculpted with clay and mud plaster um, and the eyes were inlaid with shells. Um, the archaeologists believe that this testify the, uh, the practice of revisiting, um, re-excavating buried ancestors, your grandmother or your grandfather, and reanimating their bodies um, through reflashing their skulls with uh, clay, um, with plaster, um, and giving them uh, vitality with uh, these inlaid eyes. Um, finally, um, I will return to the Paleolithic figurines of um, women like this one, uh, perhaps uh, the famous example, one of the most famous examples, um, this is one is uh, from Willendorf in Austria. Um, this is an Oolitic limestone figurine dating to 24,000 to 22,000 BCE. Um, and this covered at a Paleolithic uh, terrace site uh, that you see on the screen on the right over the Danube River uh, near the village of Willendorf. Originally colored, um, it was painted with red ochre. Um, this figurine is less than five inches uh, tall. It's, um, it's really, really tiny um, and uh, presents to us a fascinating bodily ideal of its, its time. It can fit into in the palm of your hand. Um, a voluptuous body with pendulous breasts, uh, wide hips, belly with a deep navel, um, solid ties, um, dimpled knees, and a clearly delineate, delineated vagina. Um, the head is depicted with a face, without a face, um, and decorated with a pattern that is sometimes interpreted as some kind of textile. Um, the figurine fits the, uh, the palm of your hand and it was not meant to stand as uh, the way that it was designed. Her, ra her, her arms are wrapped around her, uh, her breasts. Um, we don't um, call this figurine, as uh, many have done so in the past, as the Venus of Willendorf uh, because, um, first of all, there's no evidence that this uh, figurine actually represents a goddess or any kind of divine figure. Um, and second of all, Venus um, is um, a Roman goddess of love, uh, beauty, prosperity, and sex, and it would be incorrect and misleading um, uh, and rather anachronistic to uh, impose these associations um, with Venus over um, the figurine that we have from Willendorf. Um, so I'd, I'd like you to invite you to kind of really be diligent about um, not um, calling it Venus of Willendorf and if you see it be critical of it. Um, some scholars like um, uh, Leroy McDormand uh, and Catherine McCoy uh, uh, have proposed that such representations may illustrate bodies seen from the point of view of a pregnant woman looking at her own body. Um, which has been a really interesting and, and a kind of a welcome interpretation for many scholars writing about um, these uh, figurines. Um, I conclude this lecture uh, with the example of a nude female figurine um, from the well-known uh, Paleolithic site of Dolny Vestonich um, in the Moravian Basin of the Czech Republic, um, dated to 29,000 to 25,000 BCE. 
the statuette um, or figurine is, um, is ceramic and it's discovered alongside with thousands of other ceramic figurines uh, depicting animals, uh, some abstract bodies, um, abbreviated bodies, and, um, and some uh, and, and human, um, human bodies as well. Uh, the animals include uh, lions, uh, rhinoceroses, and mammoths. Um, clearly, a ceramic workshop uh, that were housed in a uh, that was housed in a mammoth bone shelter that you see in the bottom right. The absence of a face, wide hips, and sizable breasts, um, uh, as well as clearly marked navel, are formal characteristics that it shares with the other with the Willendorf uh, figurine. And some of the newer interpretations of these figurines um, move away from these, uh, this kind of really very uh, entrenched and ingrained interpretation of them as mother goddesses, um, uh, uh, but suggest that, uh, that they denote uh, accumulated knowledge um, uh, or experience and continuity through across generations. Uh, representing old an older woman rather than a younger uh, a younger one. Um, so this last set of figurines then refer to my third argument uh, that refer uh, to the representations of some of the human bodies um, are explicitly gendered and their sexuality is marked. Um, and the nudity they display uh, most likely presented a very positive image of a bodily ideal, um, some kind of accumulated wisdom, uh, accumulated knowledge within the society um, uh, of a, uh, an aged uh, woman who probably gave uh, multiple births. Um, and you will recall um, uh, this is also a good summary of um, of the arguments that I tried to lay out with evidence in this lecture um, that there is an interest in prehistoric art in depicting wild and ferocious animals um, and that there's this idea of the animal-human hybrids um, that allow humans or animals sort of require some kind of potency um, uh, the, the mark sexuality of, uh, of, uh, of certain figurines uh, and finally, the consciousness of death that we looked at in um, a number of uh, burials. So um, this is uh, the end of the second lecture. Um, and in the third and final one, um, I will turn to the Neolithic period and see how these themes um, either continue or get transformed. Um, uh, in the um, uh, during the Neolithic after the agricultural revolution. So thank you.